Welcome to our second video for Math 220, Applied Statistics. Uh, in this video today, I want to go over a couple of things. First, um, I have about five minute long video that I want you to watch that goes over some definitions. Um, so those definitions include random, randomization, replication, control, uh, distinguishing an observational study from a designed experiment. Um, a note on that video, they just call it an experiment, but your book calls that a designed experiment. So make sure that you're um, using the designed experiment word for, for homework problems. Um, and then it also goes over an example using experimental units, factors, levels, response variables, and treatments. And there's a lot of that stuff on this week's homework, so that would be a good thing to, to check out. Um, so if you haven't watched that yet, make sure that you go in and, and do watch that. Um, so uh, in this video, I'm going to do one more example, talking about factors, levels, and treatments, and things like that. Um, and then we're going to review some of the stuff we did last time, um, previously in class, so talking about qualitative and quantitative variables, discrete and continuous variables. Um, we'll go back over frequency and relative frequency tables. And then we'll start talking about how you might graphically display some of this stuff. So um, pie charts and bar charts, um, as well as a way of organizing tables um, for quantitative data um, called single value grouping. Um, and then spread throughout, I'll give you some tips about what you should expect to see on this week's quiz. So um, here's a list of definitions. Um, and I'll, uh, I'm not going to read through this, but you're welcome to pause the video and write these down if you don't already feel comfortable with these definitions. Uh, so on the quiz, I won't test you on the definitions of these, um, uh, so, uh, but you should understand what they are and how to apply them in examples. So uh, we're uh, talking about designed experiments, um, and uh, I think what people struggle with tends to be response variables, factors, levels, and treatments. So there was an example in the previous video um, that I didn't make that goes through that. It's a pretty good example, and I'm going to do one more now. So um, treating heart failure. So I'm going to uh, give you a minute to read this, um, and you should probably pause it, read it, and then unpause it, and we'll go from there. So assuming you've already read this, uh, a couple of things you might not be familiar with some of these things are. So ischemic and non-ischemic cardio cardiomyopathies, uh, in case you're curious. Um, the ischemic kinds, these are kinds of heart failure that are related to coronary artery disease or a previous heart attack. So these are, um, you know, build up in your heart that causes you to be uh, in heart failure. Um, Non-ischemic kinds of heart failure of cardiomyopathy are uh, other things. A lot of times these are um, inherited, like issues with your valves opening and closing improperly. Um, but the point here is that they're not related to regular old coronary artery disease where you have a buildup of, of stuff that shouldn't be there in your arteries. Um, so the, uh, so these patients, um, are all in heart failure and we're trying to decide what kind of treatment will work best for them. Um, so A, how many treatments were there? Um, so, uh, with all of these videos, I'm gonna probably not give you time to work on the answer. Um, sometimes I'll go through it, um, but I think the, the procedure that works really well with these videos is for... I'll give you a second to pause and I will stop talking for a second and that's my cue to you that I want you to work that problem and don't unpause it until you at least have a guess. Um, so you learn much better by trying and failing um, than you learn by just being told the right answer. So take a pause uh, and try to do part A. All right, so part A, I have three treatments. Um, so where I see that in here is um, they're randomly assigned in a ratio to receive an optimal pharmacologic therapy alone. So that's one of the treatments. 
or they could receive that pharmacologic therapy with a pacemaker, or they could receive that pharmacological treatment with a pacemaker and a defibrillator combination. Um, so there's three treatments there. Um, and now uh, I'm going to pause for a minute and I want you to work on B and C together. Okay, so for me here, I would consider the control group the ones that only received the optimal pharmacologic therapy. Um, it would be probably malpractice to not put patients in heart failure on any kind of protocol at all. So this is our control group. This is this is sort of the the base cases that we're we're giving them some some medicine to try to treat their heart failure. Um, for how many treatment groups were there? There's still these three. So there's the three treatment groups. Uh, and what treatments did they receive? Um, I have the three, right? So treatment one is this pharmacy, the, the medicine alone. That's our control group. Um, treatment group two is the medicine plus a pacemaker. So that's treatment group two. Uh, and treatment group three is the medicine plus a pacemaker and a defibrillator combination. Um, so a pacemaker is something that helps regulate your heartbeat um, and a defibrillator is actually something like the paddles in the medicine shows when they say clear and everybody has to get off and then the person jumps. The defibrillator is something that would actually be implanted inside your heart that would shock your heart if it stopped beating. Um, so those are our treatment groups uh, and our, the treatments that they received. Um, and now we have to figure out how many patients were in each of the treatment groups. So you can take a pause and do that yourself. Um, and the secret to this, to how many patients, is this right here, the one to two to two ratio, okay? Um, so we have probably, if there were five people in this study, there's not five people, there's 1,520 people, but if there were only five, then one would be in the control group, two would be in the pacemaker group, and two would be in the pacemaker and defibrillator group. Uh, but we need to scale that up to 1,520. Um, and to do that, my way is going to be to just divide this 1,520 number divided by 5. And I see that that's 304. Okay, so um, the reason that I divided it by 5 is that if I had 304 people in my... Let me write it this way. So if I say 1 to 2 to two, that is like saying that one-fifth of the people, right, one of our five is in control, and two-fifths are in the pacemaker group, and another two-fifths are in the defibrillator group, right? So we have one-fifth, two-fifths, and two-fifths, um, and this is a nice is of or of problem. Um, so I want to figure out what number is one-fifth of 1,520. So let me write that. And actually, rather than writing it as one-fifth, I'll write that as a decimal. So 1 divided by 5 is 0.2. So what number is uh, 0.2 of... 1,520. It's a nice trick for solving problems like this. Um, and the way that you'd solve this is I'd write my is over my of. Hmm. Actually, I'm not going to do it this way. Um, we'll do another example in class that go that way. Um, but I have, I want one-fifth of my group to be my control group. So I'm going to say that one-fifth equals the number that I'm looking for over 1,520. So um, we can solve for x by cross multiplying here. So I'll do 5 times x equals 1 times 1520. And that gives me that x is that number that I already found, which is 304. 
okay? So the number 304 is one-fifth of 1,520. So in the control group, we have 304 patients. Um, now I want to figure out what number is two-fifths of 1,520, since two-fifths of my group people will be in the pacemaker group. So I can again set up a ratio to say that 1 over 5 is x. Oops, not 1 over 5. Two-fifths is x over 1,520. And if I solve for x by cross-multiplying, so I'd say that 5x is 1,520 times 2. 1,520 times 2, that's 3,040 then I get that x divided by 5 is 608. So we'll say our pacemaker has 608 patients. And the defibrillator group also has 2 fifths, so Um, a good check on the end is that when I add all these numbers together, they better equal the number I'm looking for, which the total number of people in the group, which is 1,520. So I'll go 304 plus 608 plus 608, and I have 1,520. So that looks good. Um, and now let's explain how a table of random numbers could be used to divide the patients into three groups. Um, so this is a good moment to take a pause and think about how you would do that. And here's one way. Um, so you could take all of the patients and give them a number. One, patient one all the way up to 1,520. Um, if you randomly assigned those patients those numbers, you didn't do it in some sort of convenient way, then those numbers might already be random. So that would be one way that you could do it. Um, if those numbers are already randomized numbers, then you give one to 300, numbers one to 304, uh, the, assign them to the control group. And then you can assign numbers 608, the next 608 numbers up to the pacemaker group and the next 608 after that up to the um, defibrillator group. So that would be one way. There's more than one way to uh, use random number table for that. Okay, here's a more uh, to-the-point example. So we have a study of the effect of oat yield um, compared for three different types of oats and four different concentrations of manure. Oh, and I forgot to write what we want here. So we'll say for part A, we want to see what the experimental units are. For part B, I want to say what the response variable is. For part C, what are the factors? For part D, what are the levels of the factor? And for part E, what are the treatments? Um, and I guess the only thing to mention here as we're going through it, that CWT, this is a unit of weight. Um, it's called a, a hundred weight, um, or maybe it would be better to call it a century weight, but uh, it's about a hundred pounds. So this is zero, 20, 40, and 60 pounds of manure put on each acre to see how, um, how the oats uh, grow better. So I'm going to give you a minute, and uh, I want you to pause it and try to answer A through E. And now that we're back, um, the experimental units here, these are the things that are being tested. Those are our fields of oats. Um, the response variable, the thing that we are looking to measure, that is the crop yield of the oats um, per acre. So we'll say crop yield. Okay, and now factors. So the factor is the thing that changes. So what is the thing that changes here? Um, 
there's two factors. We have the variety of oats uh, and uh, the different concentrations of manure. So we have um, two factors, variety of oats and the concentrations of manure. Um, the levels of each factor, um, so these are sort of the degrees of each change. So we have three levels um, for the oats, right, because there's three different varieties of oats. So three levels for oats. Um, and maybe I'm just going to label those A, B, and C, just uh, so that I can uh, be more explicit with what I mean by the number of treatments for the next question. And then I have four levels for manure. We'll call this zero, two, four, and six. Um, and so in our treatments, in the video that I had you watch, uh, the person given that video just said that, um, so our treatments are, this is sort of the total number of test cases that we'd have to do if we wanted to test all of these different combinations. Um, so he said to multiply three times four, and that gives you our 12 different treatments. So let's talk about why that is. Um, so we want, would ideally like variety A of oats to be in each of the four groups. So we're going to have one treatment group that is A with a zero, another treatment group that's A2, another treatment group that's variety A with treatment four, um, with the four uh, 100 weight, and another one that's A with a 6, right? Those are four different treatment groups that are all testing the way that variety A works in the field with the different levels of fertilizer. I do the same thing for B, right? So I have a B0 group, a B2 group, a B4 group, a B6 group. And with a C, I'd have a C0, a C2, a C4, and a C6. Um, and those are all the different combinations of, um, of the two different factors that we have that we would need to sort of fully test how all of these things are working. So that's why there's 12 different treatments. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about with experimental design, and now we're moving on to chapter two. So we've already talked about this in class, about how different variables, so those are different things that we're testing, um, can be divided into qualitative and quantitative variables. Um, so qualitative variables are words, um, num uh, and quantitative variables are numbers. So right, are you male or female? That's a qualitative variable. Um, what height are you? That's a quantitative variable. With quantitative variables, we can further split that up into discrete versus continuous, where discretes are the number uh, things that are can be counted. So, how many donuts did you eat today? How many times did you, uh, I don't know, open the door to your front house? Those are discrete variables. Continuous variables are numbers that. Uh, let me give you an example: is how tall are you? How much do you weigh? Right. You are not uh, sort of everybody doesn't fall into kind of discrete countable heights, right? You could be 5'7", you could be 5'7 and a 16th, you could be 5'7 and a 32nd, you could be 5'7 and a 1,064th, right? There's a continuous number of data points in there. Um, there will be a question or two on your quiz um, testing just these definitions that you can classify those. Um, so let's go... Uh, Let's go over what I mean by that. With um, Here's a list provided by the World Meteorological Organization, um, which is a group of people that keep track of all the temperature records um, on the highest recorded temperature for each continent. And this question here is asking, what type of data is presented in each column of the table? Um, so uh, your options are qualitative or uh, quantitative. Q-U-A-N-T, and discrete or continuous. Uh, and I'll also add in a sort of not applicable type thing. Is it neither? Can it not be categorized? So take a pause and try to do that for all four of the 
columns. And now that you're back, um, we have two different qualitative variables. We have our continent and our place. So because these are qualitative variables, we cannot divide them into discrete or continuous. So it doesn't make sense to write a discrete or continuous here. So that's sort of not applicable. I'm not even going to bother answering that. Um, so um, we can only divide discrete and, and continuous uh, when we're talking about quantitative variables with numbers. Um, so we have two different quantitative things, uh, variables that have numbers. So there's our quantitative one. There's quantitative and there's another quantitative one. And these two numbers are different types of data, right? You cannot have the rank of one and a half. This is a discrete variable. Right? There is no number between one and two that could exist on this list. So this is a countable list. It has discrete variables in it. Um, this right here is a continuous variable. Right, so even though these temperatures have been rounded to the nearest degree, so you might be tempted to say that it's discrete, right? Because there's never going to be a 59.1 written on this list. Um, the distinction here is that although you're not going to write 59.1 maybe on this list, that's only because you've rounded the value. Right? There is an infinite number of temperatures that could exist between 59 and 60, right? You could have 59.1, you could have 59.15126, and that digit could just go on forever. So because this is not a countable number, because there's lots of different temperatures that are possible, infinitely many, actually, um, we call that a continuous variable. So you should expect to see something like that um, uh, on your quiz for this week. Okay, next uh, thing that I wanted to recap is um, talking about frequency, relative frequency, and percents. Um, so this is an example that we are doing in class. Um, so it was a satisfaction survey where each customer had to write down their favorite customer satisfaction airlines. Um, and from this data of 40 um, types of variables, uh, what kind of variable were they? Um, these would be qualitative variables, not quantitative variables. Uh, we took a tally of the number of E's on, on this list, and we found that there were 13 tallies, so there were 13 of them. Um, our total was that there was 40 of these responses. So in order to get a relative frequency column, we divided 8 by 40 and got 0.200. Um, and to convert that to percent, you multiply it times 100 and to get that as a 20%. So frequency, relative frequency, and percent are all things that say many similar things, but these two should almost think of as vocab words, right? You may think relative frequency and percent are kind of the same thing, um, but they are different numbers, right? One number is 100 times bigger than the other number. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're going through homework and things like that. Um, and on your quiz, I will have you make a simple frequency table um, and distinguish, uh, do some sort of distinguishing with the frequency, relative frequency, and percent. Um, and so you should make sure you're sort of comfortable with, with that. There's a few problems on the homework that, um, that work on that as well. Um, so that's one that we did in class. Let's do another one. So is there... An edge in roulette. So roulette is this game where you spin a wheel around and it either comes on red, black, or green. Um, so one of the, what is that, 36, 37, 38 different numbers in the wheel will get selected. Um, and your chances of spinning red, black, or green, um, you obviously have a much greater chance of getting red or black than green. So this is a, somebody watched 200... 200 roulette spins and counted the number of times that the ball landed on each color in 200 trials. Um, 
So later in this semester, we'll get to start about talking about whether or not this, this uh, observation that this person made shows that the black is actually more likely. So um, was it, is it that the black is more likely on this roulette wheel, or is it just that it was sort of a random chance that you happened on, to land on more black than red for these 200 trials? But if you did 2,000 trials, these would be more even. Um, we'll get there with that, but we're not there yet. Um, right now, all I want to do is make um, a table with frequency, relative frequency, and percent. Uh, and then I want to introduce some new types of graphing, which would be ways that we can, we can organize these uh, qualitative variables. So I have color, frequency, relative frequency, and percent. And we're going to do red, black, and green. And this is a good time to pause it and do your best to fill out this table. And when you're back, um, I've already done the tallying for us, so we don't need to do like we did with the airline thing where we tally up a bunch of numbers. We'll just say that that has already happened. We have 88 reds, 102 blacks, and 10 greens. Um, for a total, and I'll add this extra line in here, which is a good line to include, of 88 plus 102 plus 10, which is 200. The relative frequency here will be 88 over 200, which is 0.44. Um, this one will be 0.51, and this one is 0.05. If I add up 0.44 plus 0.51 plus 0.05, I get one, and that's normal. Sometimes it won't be exactly one because there might be a little bit of rounding error in here, and that's okay if this was 0.99 or 1.01. Um, and to get that to a percent, I multiply 100, so that's 44%, 51%, and 5%. And those should all add up to 100%. Okay. So there's our relative frequency distribution with frequency, relative frequency, and percent. So I guess we probably actually only needed this one for the way this question is worded. Um, to draw a pie chart, we would like to be able to put these things in a circle. And I'm going to just show you what this looks like. Um, actually, let's do the bar chart first because we can just uh, draw that that way. Um, for this bar chart, um, I want to plot on my bar chart the percent of frequency. Okay, so frequency is not all that useful of a number because uh, Generally speaking, relative frequency and percent are, are more useful numbers to look at because it's just easier for us to look at a percent than it is to look at a whole number. So um, we're going to make a graph that looks something like this. And I need to make sure my graph goes up to a maximum of 44. So I'll go ahead and just put 10% um, here, 20% here, 30%. 40% and 50%. And I need to make sure I include titles, um, labels on the X and the Y axis. So we have red, black, and green. Um, I will put here that this is number. Right, I have a label on my x-axis and then a label on my y-axis, which will be percent of frequency. And then some sort of title. The most generic title here that you could put is color. You could be a little bit better and say color on the American roulette wheel, something like that. Um, and for my red, that represents 44% of all the data. So I would draw a bar that goes all the way up to about 44%. Um, probably shade that in in some sort of way that makes it clear to see. Um, black is 51, so I want to go black all the way up to here. I'll draw a bar that looks like that. 
and green was only 5%, so I'll have my bar that only goes up to 5%. Um, so this is one of the most basic ways that you could organize data um, in a bar chart. Another way that you could organize data is in a pie chart. Um, and here is what the pie chart for this data looks like. Um, here's my color. I have a label here with the blacks, the reds, and the green. And red is 44%, black is 51%, and green is 5%. Um, so we want to figure out how do we get um, a pie chart so that this right here, this slice of the pie, actually represents 5% of the angles in, the, in our pie. Uh, and we're going to set up another ratio just like we did for that uh, problem earlier with the, um, with the heart failure patients. Right, so I want 5 out of 100, right, 5% equals x out of the number of degrees in a circle, and that's 360. Right, so this will tell us the number of degrees to include. So I can cross multiply again. I'll get 100x is 5 times 360 is 1800. So x is 18 degrees. I could do the same thing for um, for the 44% red data. So this would be green. Red, I'm going to say 44 over 100 equals x over 360. And that will give me 158 degrees. And for the black, I'll say 51 over 100 equals x over 360. And that should give me 183 degrees. Um, and I'm not going to expect you to do sort of protractor type drawing with these. When we do this, I'll either be asking you to pick the right pie chart or to, to draw one on a computer. Um, but there's 360 degrees in a circle, 183 is just larger than 360, and you can see that this black here, right, this right here would be 180 degrees, which is just a little bit more than 180 degrees, um, and the red falls into, red and the green together sort of fall into that other way. Um, so that's what a pie chart would look like of that data. And I think that is where we are going to end for today. Um, so we've talked about how, how qualitative data are uh, organized, and we next need to start talking about how one might organize quantitative data. And there's a lot more options when your data, when your variables down here are not, uh, art can be numbers. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to, um, to organize that data. And we just look through. Uh, the only other thing that is on the quiz this week that I haven't yet covered um, is there will be a question that asks you about the distinction between stat stratified random sampling and cluster sampling. So if you're not clear on that still, you can go back to last week's video or sort of review notes or homework assignments and stuff like that. Um, but that'll be one question on the quiz as well. And that sort of covers all the things that are on the quiz and we're ready for class.